So um, welcome. Um, this is um, one of our panel discussions as part of a, an overall um, series of events where we're kind of exploring and talking about the role that additive technology has uh, for supply chains. And um, this is a topic that, you know, we've been thinking a lot about for the last uh, couple of years and the, the panelists we're going to hear from today have been working on this area for, for, uh, for quite a while. Um, we've always known that one of the real use cases for additive is to help build more resilient, more redundant, more agile supply chains, right? It's a type of technology that allows us to have a lot of flexibility in what we build and how we build it. Uh, so we can really do that at the point of need. And I think, you know, then the pandemic kind of hit and um, I think it's really accelerated and brought stark a lot of these uh, trends that we've seen. You know, um, this is probably the largest disruption we've seen uh, to, to supply chains in, in the modern human history over the last uh, six to nine months. And, you know, this is a topic that probably is usually reserved for textbooks, uh, academics. It's uh, maybe not something we all talk about as part of our everyday lives. But of course, uh, you know, all of you and all of us, uh, we've been living this, right? Um, every day that we go to the store, we recognize the fact that uh, something has changed. Uh, the supply chains are not running in their normal ways. People have gotten to be quite flexible. Uh, and also uh, demand has changed. Um, you know, one of the things that we often forget about is that um, you know, demand is not static. The things that people want can, uh, can change quickly in our modern world. And during the pandemic, we've seen that as well. Um, you know, here in America, you know, uh, we're not going uh, to public places as much. So things like consumption of uh, food and consumption of uh, things like uh, cleaning supplies at home have skyrocketed and our supply chains uh, took a while to catch up. So it's a great example just of how um, in our modern dynamic world, uh, things can change quickly. And we need to think of ways as manufacturers that we can build and respond uh, in the moment to what we see in the world. And so today I have two panelists with me from um, Siemens Energy. Uh, and we're gonna have a chat about what, uh, what they've been doing and what their, their company has been doing uh, over the last couple of years uh, to explore and use additive technology. Uh, I'd like to start with just some background uh, on, on both of them. And also, by the way, um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to use the question function uh, on the webinar here, and uh, we'll be getting to those as we go. So feel free to, to throw things in there if there's uh, questions, topics, things you'd like to hear about. Um, I'd like to start by um, welcoming uh, Pontus uh, Johansson uh, here, and uh, I'd like to uh, get a little background. Uh, uh, Pontus, uh, what, what is your role and uh, where are you working from? So I'm in, uh, in Finnspon, which is a tiny little community in the south of Stockholm in Sweden, uh, where Siemens Energy has a, a site where we design and build and service medium-sized gas turbines. Uh, so I first entered the, the, the gates into here 21 years ago. I've been out of here for a while as well, also leaving Siemens Energy, also working for other Siemens Energy locations. But, I keep coming back here and, and here since 2014, I've been mostly, well, within didn't seem to send it, since 14, mostly working with additive manufacturing challenges. Uh, first of all, setting up a factory focused on additive technologies and how to industrialize that. And that's really my, my key role now is that industrialization challenge around additive technologies and how to make additively designed components running smoothly through our value chains. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Pontus. Uh, and then I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Cliff Hatcher. Uh, uh, Cliff and, and Pontus have worked together in the past. Uh, Cliff, uh, could you introduce yourself and some of your background? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Cliff Hatcher. I uh, work in Orlando, Florida for Siemens Energy. I'm the general manager of the Innovation Center. Um, and basically what the Innovation Center is, is, it's a dedicated space for really accelerating the development uh, you know, of, of solutions for our service industry. Uh, we do a lot of rapid prototyping, a lot of testing here. Um, using added to manufacturing makes that possible in a very efficient uh, you know, manner. Um, we have about 40 engineers working inside the facility, um, and it's really bringing the engineers, bringing the, the correct resources, the equipment, all under one roof so that we can respond uh, much quicker to, to new opportunities within our industry. I've been working for Siemens for uh, 20 plus years now. Uh, started in Houston, and then from Houston went to Pittsburgh, and then now I've been in, in Orlando since uh, 2006. Awesome. 
Um, let's see. So I think I want to start by by learning a little bit more about the Innovation Center. Um, so, you know, I think um, the industrialization, as Pont has said, of new technologies um, often requires a lot of change, right? Uh, change in the way that we think, change in the way that we work, change in the equipment that we use. So um, I'd love to hear Cliff from you and then, and then maybe uh, Pontus, you can add some as well. Just um, what was the reasoning behind setting up an innovation center? Like, how have you thought about that? What, what's kind of its uh, goal and, uh, and why, why sort of locate everything in one place? What was the reasoning behind that? Definitely, we had a lot of, lot, lot of small labs uh, within Siemens and I was working on various projects to support the service. Um, and we were constantly going out to vendors and things like that to be able to do any type of manufacturing, any type of prototyping. And it, it took a long time to set up these vendors to, to find the right person to do, to make a, a particular widget or something like that. And so we discovered that if we could put everything under one roof, give the engineers the, the right tools to, to prototype, that we could get to a solution much faster. And so from there, me and Pontus worked together, find, figuring out how we could pitch a innovation center, how we could uh, understand which equipment to have, what would be needed, what would be the skill set of the engineers. Um, and we, we started that process and we created a business case for it. And then in 2019, January 2019, we had the opening of, of the facility. Awesome. And um, how does that work? So, so Pontus, you're obviously, you, you were there uh, when the center opened. Um, you're, you're now over in Sweden. How does it work, um, you know, across this multinational company that is Siemens? So how do people use that if they're not uh, located near it? It's, I would say something like the Innovation Center, right? to make it useful, you need to be close to it. I think that having that easy access is one of the keys, I think, to, to be able to make rapid prototyping. I, I think that's, as much as digital tools and you know, having webcasts, it's, it's cool, it helps sharing information, it helps with innovation. But some of the things I think that Cliff is making over in Orlando, it, it really requires the presence, right? He can't send his team home during COVID because they have to be on the shop floor to make these things. And it's a lot of stuff where you actually have to touch and feel and, and assemble and disassemble and do stuff physically in order to make progress. So I think it's, it's great that we have this in Orlando and it's something we can communicate around and you know, share experiences, but it's, it's, it's not the case that we could send any task from anywhere in the world to Cliff and he could figure it out because some stuff, you know, he would need components or you know, the experience of specific people. So it's, but the same way, Orlando is a big, a big uh, city for us in terms of number of employees and the skill sets we have there. So it's it's a great place to have this type of innovation center. Uh, mm. So it's it's great, but it, it we can't have one innovation center for all of the world. But that's it, it. It's going to require multiple. You know that, and that is something that we are evaluating. Um, like Ponte says, the the, the 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 strongest part of the innovation center is the collaboration. Uh, we have set it up so that we can bring in engineers from from other groups, other organizations, internal, external, to to really have a collaborative space to where you're discussing a design that morning, and then you have it in your hands that afternoon, right? You get that fit function test in their hands, and you can make changes, and so really creating that collaborative space to to do that, and then having the tools to to manufacturing to to be able to have something in your hand that day. Yeah, about uh, that, that word collaborative, uh, which keeps coming up, I think it reminds us, right, where, you know, ostensibly, uh, we're, we're talking about technology, right? You know, right. The, the, this is Mark Forge, we're hosting this, we, we make, you know, 3D printers and a platform, but perhaps at the end of the day, the story is much more about the people uh, who use the technology uh, than the technology itself, right? This idea of bringing, bringing people together to, to work on, uh, on a project. Um, Cliff, could you give us just a little bit of background? Maybe like, what, well, yeah, what does a standard engagement look like at the Innovation Center? Does someone come in with one specific problem? Um, how, how does that usually work? We, we, we do a lot of our research and development here. And so we have our, our, our technology roadmaps that we're developing towards. And at the same time, um, the word gets out there as far as the capabilities. And so we have a lot of engagement from engineers that are working on R&D themselves or any technical issues. And they, they typically come to the center, they, they, they tour the, the facility, they look at the capabilities, and then they start to engage on, on the projects they're working on. And, and we bring in engineers that can be mechanical, electrical, aero, physics, whatever, and we can bring them in and we can start the discussion of, of, of how we can help them. And then from there, we initiate a project and then we have deliverables and things like that that are, that are, are normal in, in a project scope. 
but it, it really starts with coming to the center, seeing the capabilities and having that, that discussion, um, you know, what, how we can innovate, how we can get to solutions much faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, can we get a little bit of background on, on uh, what are the capability sets? So uh, what, what are some of the equipment you have over there? Definitely, we have um, a lot of Mark Forge printers. Um, we do a lot of rapid prototyping with that. Um, we have a fully functional uh, machine shop, uh, five axis CNC's, three axis CNC, water jet, a lot of EDM cutting machines. Um, we have uh, metal 3D printers. Um, we have non-destructive testing. Uh, we do do non-destructive testing here. We do volumetric measurements, CT, UT. Um, I'm probably forgetting a few off the top of my head. Uh, we do a lot of automation. So we have uh, 17 robotic arms within the facility uh, where we're, we're, we're testing out the feasibility of doing automation within the power generation industry. Um, and so that's a, a lot of different capabilities here. And we're always looking to grow and to, to new things. So as the business changes, as the market changes, um, we have a diverse engineering team that can pivot and go in different directions. That sounds like a fun place. That's, uh, that's a point there, Rafi. I mean, you have a lot of cool technical stuff, but you also have the team that actually, you know, yeah, that does the real, let's say, the real work, right? Yeah. Who, who I mean, grabs the challenge and executes on it. I, I've been working for Siemens Energy for over 20 years, and I've never designed a gas turbine. I've always supported the, the testing and everything like that. So we've kind of built the team in that way to, that we can pivot and change and support wherever we need. Yeah, a bit, very similar. I mean, the, t the, the topic, right, uh, the narrow topic is sort of re resiliency and agility, but, um, but I think it's exactly right, right? And it's not just one technology type, it's a mentality. It's, it's a group of people working together using that same organizing principle. Um, and, we're, actually, and we're lucky that we're, we're near UCF. So we, we have a very strong talent pool that we can pull from. Um, if I need a new engineer, you know, we're, we're always looking. And so they're having them so close to our facility, it, it really helps out. Yeah, it's awesome to have yeah, kind of a, a feeder set of people coming in, uh, eager to join and then try new technology. That's, uh, that's super awesome. Yep. Um, actually, it strikes me maybe um, we didn't necessarily talk a little bit about um, what does uh, Siemens Energy actually do? So maybe uh, Pontus, maybe we get a little bit of background on uh, what, what, what is it that, that you guys are engaged in? Absolutely. So if people hear about Siemens, I typically might think of oh, white goods, stuff like that, that you can see, you know, kitchen appliances or, or stuff like that. But the Siemens Energy brand that came to life was it three weeks ago now. We were spun off from Siemens, right? So we're our own standalone company. So we provide energy solutions. So whatever you need in terms of power feed, electricity in, in your wall socket or to your CT scanner at a hospital or you know your industrial need of power for whatever you're making, running or air conditioning in Florida or your central heating up in Boston, we provide the, the backbone for that. So the, the the electricity generators, the transmission networks, and that includes both the large uh, utility type of, of power plants, also the smaller industrial power plants that might be used to feed you know, smaller facilities like say industrial complexes or even you, you know, you'd have large uh, hospitals, for example, that has a gas turbine in their basement to, to ensure they have uh, a redundant energy feed to to not risk anything in terms of having that power redundancy. So we do that. So we do that on, on a variety of fuels as well. So if you look at it historically, there would be steam turbines powered by coal, transitioning to oil, transitioning to gas. And now a lot of our R&D spending is focused on hydrogen solutions. So the future sustainable energy solutions in terms of non-CO2 non emitting uh, energy solutions. And as an addition to that, we're not only building gas turbines, we also have our wind turbine section that's now part of Siemens Energy. So we, we are working, so our, our main goal basically long-term is to be the driver of a, of a sustainable energy transition. That's our, our long-term goal. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Looks like uh, I had a question, my, Michael. Yeah, well, one of the things yeah, you, you talked about long-term and I, I think it's interesting. I mean, uh, Siemens is a, a fascinating company, uh, you know, uh, multinational, you have a long history, so yeah. What are some of the time horizons that, that you think about um, when working on investments like an innovation center or new technologies you're looking at? I get the sense that they're uh, maybe longer than the, uh, the average company might be looking at. I would say that, you know, 
the innovation center itself, I mean, of course, you know, we're, we're, we have our fair share of BAs, right? We have to have a financial payback on a lot of the investments we do. And that has to be within an acceptable time frame. But yes, our strategic game plan is much longer. So 2050, yes, that's part of our, our game plan in terms of how do we view the energy market in, in 30 years from today? And how will we find our position in that to remain a, a relevant player? Also because the, our customers, when they, you know, when they spend a lot of capital buying equipment from us, that equipment will be operational for a minimum of 15 years, typically 30. And we have, we have units out in the world that are over 70 years old, still running and still being maintained and serviced. And we have to figure out a way to continue to maintain those units for them. So yeah. our, our business is, is it's a very long game. I think I think that that um, that time horizon um, is is really interesting to think about because um, you know yeah you can't predict the future, um, but I think you have some good ideas as to where where trends are sending us, uh, what some of the big big ideas that are going to happen, and then again uh, like like Cliff said, you know setting up a, a kind of a group of people ready to respond to those challenges, right? So maybe they don't know exactly what they're going to be working on, but they know the the general set of skills required, they know the general set of goals, uh, and then can respond in the moment um, is a, is a really neat. Way of, of approaching this problem space. Um, so maybe wrapping this together, we have a question here. Um, the specific question is just around like uh, what parts of a gas turbine um, are, are, are made uh, or printed. Um, but I, I think the answer to that question may be more complicated. And, and as you said, you know, some of these things were made many years ago. Perhaps you're using technology to service them or to fix them in addition to just making the objects. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about how additive is used today uh, in, in, uh, in and around the turbines that are made by your company. You want to start Cliff or? I'll let you start that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, I mean, a gas turbine for those who are on a, unfamiliar with it, it's basically, a, an oversized jet engine, right? Which you use instead of using it to pro for propulsion on an airplane, you use it to, to generate electricity through a, a generator. So it's, it's, it's a large complex engine. Uh, and what we can do with additive technologies is to improve the efficiency of these engines by making more complex geometries that has better cooling, better lifetime, uh, higher direct efficiency, but by changing the geometry using additive skills or additive possibilities, we can make uh, a better end product. So the, the hot and difficult parts of those gas turbines as one of the drivers why we are using additive technologies. But that was, say, the, the old, say, the, the metal side of additive, right? We, we can't use your, your, uh, your X7 printers for this because, again, the Onyx would just, it would be a millisecond and then it's gone. So it's, that's one side of our additive solution. There, of course, is we do, in making these ones, let's say you make a very advanced geometry, almost like organic shaped, and you need to clamp it down to do some polishing. How do you clamp it down? Well, suddenly we need a fixture. And how do you make a very advanced fixture? Well, it's a lot easier to make it additively than to try to machine out a fixture that can do its clamping. So suddenly, okay, it's time to turn to the next seven or a Mark II and see, can you create a fixture that's good enough to clamp this piece to, to do the final machining, the final polishing, the final quality assurance. So it's the additive technologies. And yes, we use it additive for our end parts, but you also use it to make those end parts. And I think Cliff will fill in here in terms of how do we use it over the life cycle, right? Because I know that Cliff has a whole number of very cool fixes. Oh, definitely, and that's, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you got the on-engine stuff, the, everything's supporting that in the, in the manufacturing process for using additive manufacturing. Um, from soft jaws when, we, when we're doing traditional CNC machining um, to fixturing, to even just prototyping a part before you actually go into machining to get that feel of, of what it looks like. I mean, like we were talking earlier, I, I just made this last night and it's for my own personal use, but this is becoming the norm is you're going to design something and then you're going to print it. You're going to fill it, see what it feels like. And then you're going to make the decision to go into the final machining. We're seeing more and more of that. It doesn't limit the design space that, you know, we can, we print that for, for a few dollars. Um, and it's, and that's, that's, that's where additive manufacturing, I think is, is the, is really strong right now is the support is the everything leading up to, to final manufacturing. Yeah. 
So um, I'll just uh, a couple of things. So uh, Pond has mentioned a couple MarkForge printers. So as uh, as a representative <laughs> for MarkForge, I'll just uh, uh, clarify. So right, uh, MarkForge makes uh, a platform that supports both uh, plastic uh, printing and reinforced plastic with carbon fiber, uh, and then also uh, a metal system that's a sort of a, a safe and accessible way to print metal. Um, and so the Mark II and the X7 are two of the uh, the, the composite printers that we have uh, that Pontus was talking about there. Um, it's uh, it's interesting when we talk about the word supply chain. I think a lot of times we think of the end use part, right? How do I get the end thing that I need? But I think in reality, a lot of the supply chain problems that you face as a manufacturer are probably around the parts needed to actually do the manufacturing, right? So, you know, if a, if a critical part breaks on your line, all of a sudden you, you can't build anymore, right? You got to shut things down. You got to wait either for replacement, you have to fix it somehow. So, um, I get the sense that a lot of what we're talking about when we talk about supply chain resiliency may not be about the end use, but maybe about all the things you need to do to keep your operation going. No, so I don't know, maybe uh, you want to we, talk we, about Exactly right. We have cases where we've printed spacers, we've printed washers to keep things going, right? Things that you can typically get the next day from, from, a, from a vendor, uh, but due to the supply chain management disruption and, and everyone not being able to respond, there's there's been times uh, within our in, within my facility where we just printed it. We just printed it and, and had it that afternoon, versus having to wait a week or things like that. And and we're seeing a lot of that. And the engineers know the capabilities of the printers, knowing the capabilities of what we can do with added manufacturing. And when you come up to that hurdle, you can either wait or you can respond. And our team is responding and and being creative of how we're we're um, dealing with the situation. Yeah, that's a, a it's a story we, we hear a lot at Mark Forge um, of sort of like um, the uses of the machine, right? A lot of times maybe someone buys the machine with one specific use case in mind, like one one part that is you know super annoying, super expensive. Um, but once you realize how flexible the tool is, you start to see problems all around you, right? That could be solved. Um, yeah. uh, Cliff, Cliff is holding up a, a part here today that is, uh, is, it, is it solving a problem in your short game? Is that, is that? Uh, yes, yes <laughs> it's, it's my, my next putter, so yeah. <laughs> but that's exactly, I think, the spirit though, which is that uh, it's such a flexible tool. Um, you know, you, you start to see problems all over the place uh, that where it can be applied. Um, I'd actually maybe like to hear a little bit about um, your backgrounds, uh, just um, how you ended up uh, sort of working on this technology in this area. Um, maybe start with you, Pontus. Um, uh, you have a background in engineering. How, how did yes. you end up here? So engineering, got a PhD in operations management, and I always worked with value chain problem solving. And the problem that came alive for us in 14 was we, we saw a potential using added technology for, for one of our components to do a, a repair, to refurbish a component. But the challenge then was, okay, we can do this as a one-off prototype. And, and the task then became, how do we industrialize this? How do we make this by basically by the thousands uh, each year? And in terms of setting up a factory that's capable of, of managing this new technology. So I, well, so, so that's how I first got dragged into, oh, okay, so what are the challenges around additive technology and, and what do we need to change in our, in our value chain setup to, to manage this technology? Because what we can see, I think it's kind of at least a two directional thing, right? You, with additive, we're changing how we can, I wish I was in a proper lecture room, and, but basically in, in one direction, you have the, the change in, in product features, the geomet ge geometrical change, right? The functional change of the part. And on the other side, you have some kind of change in your value chain setup, right? You're not producing that, that new part with new features. It's not produced according to your conventional methods. So you, you, you're kind of introducing two different things here. And that in total means, okay, you got to rethink things, right? How do you make this continuously? Okay, it's, it's not a conventional CNC machine with, with, with machine tools to it. It's, it's something else. And how do you test and qualify that new, very different shape from, from how you used to test with no, uh, CMM or whatever. You, you used to have some conventional way of testing it, and, and this has changed. So, how do we make? How do we? You know, how do you do your factory layout? How do you do your factory shop floor control system? How do you make sure you have your EHS, whatever in place, right? In terms of, if you work with metal powder, what does that mean? If you work with melting plastics, what does that mean in terms of of employers um, employee safety, for example? So it's all of that had to be taken into account and how do we design a, 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 
industrial facility to handle this. So, so that's how it kind of came into my task to see, okay, I, I wasn't really a specialist on, on the additive technology itself or the design, but how do you take these new day, daily challenges of running an additive facility and, uh, and, and make it work? Yeah, I think it, uh, that's something we often hear. You know, um, folks that end up adopting this type of technology get very excited about it. I think one of the things that's so exciting is it causes you to go back to your first principles in many cases, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think a lot of engineering, we kind of build up, you know, how something is done based on history, right? We've done it many, many times mm -hmm. before. We kind of know what the properties are. We know how it's going to work. And you don't always get to go back to your first principles <laughs> and actually say, well, wait a second, how would you measure the effectiveness of this? Or uh, how do I know that it's, uh, it is correct or not? So I, I get the sense that some of the fun of this area is actually having to go back to the sort of the, 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 the really early parts of your engineering history uh, and apply those to this new area of technology. Um, Cl Cliff, what was your journey uh, to get here? Yeah. I know you yeah, probably, if, before I put the management hat on, uh, I said here at the Innovation Center, I was an engineer uh, designing a lot of inspection equipment. Um, and the inspection equipment that, that we were designing were, was, was along the lines of visual inspection. And when you're talking about large gas turbines or steam turbines or generators, you're having to do an inspection going through an eight millimeter uh, borescope port. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can buy off the shelf, but you're limited on what the capabilities are as far as the resolution, what you can see. And so during that time, we were in the process of designing very high visual optics systems that, that, that could uh, take pictures of, of indications, discontinuities and things like that. And so we went down the path of uh, exploring additive manufacturing to, to really rapid prototype a lot of the, the casings for the cameras and things like that. And um, we discovered fairly quickly that we could actually use what we were printing as the final product. And so um, that's when it was just me and uh, one of my other colleagues, Forrest Brugge, working out of a closet in a lab over in Castleberry, <laughs> where it went from two of us and then 10 years later, there's 40 of us. And so <laughs> additive manufacturing is, has been part of the, the ride all the time, but just because we looked at it as a very simple way to, to really test out our design prototype and like we said we got lucky that we could actually use some of the the prints for a final product yeah that, that's also a, a story we often hear which is that yeah, you start out assuming you're kind of making a prototype uh, and then yeah. you, you recognize uh, <laughs> part way through that actually wait a second th this will actually work for the real job um, exactly <laughs> it's like a great moment um we have a couple questions coming in uh again reminder uh to to the audience uh please uh keep keep adding questions i want to ask a couple of these uh, it's a question from philip here um around the topic of energy efficiency, which I think, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps is the, is, the, is the core thing that we're all working on. But um, it's, it, uh, Philip says it's the energy efficiency is a little bug that keeps us awake at night. Um, Mark Forged and, and many others are really trying to make manufacturing more energy efficient. And uh, many companies are trying to go in sort of modular uh, uh, sort of uh, strategies here. Um, how is Siemens addressing uh, off-grid concern uh, for all different kinds of manufacturing around efficiency, uh, self-reliance, uh, and I assume also um, sort of the ability to be renewable. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, I mean for us, I, for us, it's, it's, I have to split it in different terms. So one, in terms of being renewable or, you know, sustainable in terms of any solution or, or being zero, uh, zero net emis emitter as a company, which we have in our targets as well. Uh, so if, if we look at our products and for our end products to be, uh, say, more energy efficient. Yeah, that's why the reason we use additive, right? It improves the efficiency of the turbines that are used across the world by, but, but they're not used by us. That's, you know, those are products used by our customers. And in that, of course, see, can we provide products that can run on zero CO2 emitting fuels like hydrogen? Uh, so, so that's one side of it where we put a lot of focus. The other is, for example, if you look at our production setup, we are measuring, monitoring how much energy we're using. And if we, we, come up with a new component or a new way of working, a new manufacturing process. That's one of the things we also look at to see how much, how energy efficient is this production method itself? So how much energy do we actually use in terms of producing the, the components we're looking at? Uh, but at the same time, I would, I have to say, I think when you look at what we make, it's, it's 
the total impact, you know, the, the global impact of our products is much stronger on how our products are used by our end customers than how much energy we actually use to make those parts here and now. I mean, it's, that, that's critical, but it's something that is always on our agenda to see are we energy efficient or not and, and are we progressing towards this goal that we have of being a, a zero CO2 emitter in, in a number of years from today. So it's, it's part of our game plan, but it's, it's, we see it as, you know, there are a few different sides of this energy efficiency. But of course, if we work with energy, energy efficiency, it's, that's really the core of the game, isn't it? If, if we make a better component or a better product, that typically means we make a product that has a higher uh, net efficiency than our competitors. That's really the, one of the absolute key metrics. Awesome. Uh, uh, Cliff, any, anything to add on that? No. <laughs> covered that one pretty well. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's see, a couple other questions we have here. Um, so uh, Gary has a question, uh, uh, kind of a more technical question, which I, I'd be interested to see how you want to answer. Um, how do you cater in, uh, in your modeling for parts that are made by additive um, that exhibit maybe a predictable, compressible, or deformable shape profile? Um, would you still use the same reference sets? Uh, can parts made for additive allow for this type of sort of compression or flexibility consideration? Uh, how, how do you think about that versus traditional manufacturing? And uh, I don't know, uh, Cl Cl I don't know, uh, Cliff, do you want to you start with this one? I'll let Pontus start with this one. This is <laughs> so, uh, so flexibility, right? It's, you know, for us, we th most people might think of metal as being solid, but metal is flexible, right? And plastic for or composites, absolutely flexible. So the flexibility aspect for us, that's a key, one of the key material properties that we work with in all our designs. So flexibility is, is an engineered part of our components in, in most instances. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a good answer, but. And, and also there's, it's also how you do the print too. There's, there's all different characteristics and, and uh, variables that you have to take account to or when you're laying the print out, are you printing it vertical, are you printing it horizontal? And so okay. that's, a, that's a little bit of the, the recipe of how, or the cookbook of how we are able to be successful is those details. And there is some science behind that, but there is a lot of trial and error too. So, yeah. and that's that's science and trial and error that goes for both metal and composites. And especially when you add the fiber, it gets sort of interesting. I think it's a good word, right? It's yeah. it is interesting. There's a lot of learnings to be had. There's no there's no easy fix to it. There's a lot of learnings still to be had. And that really goes into those that we really do. Um, we challenge our team to to use as much as possible the additive manufacturing machines so that they can build up that experience of understanding, you know, if they print a certain way, this is the type of part that they're gonna get. If they do it a different way, the, the, you know, how the strength and the, and the weaknesses are. And so that's where we, we challenge our team to become very knowledgeable uh, on all aspects of, of the equipment that we're using. Yeah, I, I think, you know, like a lot of engineering, right? Yeah, it has, um, it, it, it has a science behind it, but it really is about uh, learning how to apply it, right? Learning yeah. where, where and when uh, and I know designing for additive, um, you know, oftentimes requires a, a bit of a different mindset, right? You're thinking about different characteristics, different uh, considerations. Um, I'll make a, a shout out here, uh, Mark Forge on our website. Uh, we have a guide, a designing for additive guide, which is a good starting point uh, if you're looking at some of this stuff. And then we also have um, a couple online courses, uh, sort of we've made our Mark Forge University, which is a, a program we make available to, to our customers, uh, get hands-on uh, sort of training um, from, from our engineers who, who know a lot about the machines. Uh, and that's now available online. So if, um, if anyone out there is interested, uh, please feel free to visit the website and you can take a look at that uh, if you wanna learn some more about different ways of uh, designing and working with this technology. Um, let's see. Um, one other um, specific technical question, and then I'm going to move to sort of a, a broader uh, future looking one. Uh, but Gary has one more question around the, um, the approach to determine how a study of a machined part design um, requires a five axis CNC as compared to say a CNC uh, with lesser, uh, lesser dimensions or axis of motion or when to consider uh, whether using additive um, for something. So how do you think about that decision process? I suppose the question is, you know, here's a problem you have. Do you go for the five axis CNC? Do you go for a simpler CNC? Do you go with additive? Is it a, is it a feel, a personal choice? How, how do you start off in that process? 
I mean, for us is that we're, before we even go into a, a final machine, we're, we're 3D printing it. Um, and there's a reason for that is that we want to get, do a fit function test a lot of times on, on our prototypes prior to going into the more expensive machining process. Um, and then once we do that fit function test, you know, from the added to manufacturing part, um, then we decide, you know, we work with the machinists, we work with the guys that are creating the cam to, to understand uh, the, the, based on the geometry, how many axes of freedom we're going to need for that machining process. And so based on that, that that's, kind of, that's kind of the workflow process here within, within this facility. And I mean, the key, key things to consider also in that decision is once you start designing something with additive in mind, will you really be able to make it on a, on a subtractive yeah. machining center? So it's that, I think that's, in some instances, that's the direction we're going, right? We, we have more and more parts that cannot be done any other way than with additive yeah. technologies. So yeah, that is a game changer here as well. If you got hidden features or features with overhangs that you would not be able to get a, a milling bid or something like that into, that's where added manufacturing is going to, to, to really shine. So those are the, like Planta says, there's just some things that we cannot machine that you can make with added manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's, we, we see that as well as sort of the sweet spot of, of, of sort of applications that our customers often will, will land on or, or tell us about. I mean, we, we know that they're printing lots of things, but the things that they tend to talk to us about um, are those that are sort of uniquely possible uh, via this technology. Correct. Yeah, because really, if, if it's from a practical perspective, being very blunt about additive, right? If, if, you, if you have a component that could be easily machined, typically it's cheaper to machine. And not always, of course, but it typically it's cheaper. Of course, you can have a, a lead time advantage that's huge with additive, and that could be a justifier. But if something is fairly readily machinable, that's typically the cheaper option. But it might not be the fastest option. And, uh, you know, looking at Cliff especially, right? speed is, is of the essence yeah. a lot of times. So it's, it, it, it's, also a a it's also a consideration of the volume I and mean, how many are you making, right? If it's just one off, maybe add this that, or if it's it's a large volume, maybe you already set up a program to run it on CNC. So there's a lot of different variables that that can come into play when you're you're looking at manufacturing something. Yeah, and I think that's that, and that's that's why I think um, a lot of times as we um, up level this set of problems, they end up we end up talking about supply chains, right? Because it, a supply chain is much more complicated than just um, what's the cost of the object uh, that I'm getting, right? Uh, how long will it take? Uh, what redundancies do I have? Uh, what's the quality that it comes at? Um, you know, all these things probably enter into our calculations as to what's the appropriate way to set up a supply chain. And I think what you're both showing us is that um, it's not as simple as uh, this technology or that technology, right? It's a, it's a multivariable problem and one that does require a lot of different approaches based on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, which I think, I think is why this is such a fascinating area. I, I look at it like it's a toolbox. The more, more tools you have in your toolbox, the more you can do, and the faster you can do it. So. Uh, and, you know, and you need to learn which tool to use for which task, right? Exactly. It's, you can, can use a hammer try to hammer a screw, but it's still not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of that comes from experience, right? So I think it's, yeah. you know, it's not, there's not a, a book you can read on it necessarily. It's, it's something you have to try it out and see what works. No, we've looked for the book. We can't find it, so we have to... <laughs> <laughs> Um, so may, maybe maybe using that as a springboard uh, moving forward. So uh, we have a, a question here, a big big question from Ashton, um, which is looking into the future. So you know, thinking about the supply chain disruptions that we've just been living through, um, what industries do you think are going to start uh, investing in and looking at this type of technology? Um, just you know, you, you guys operate in one industry, but from your vantage point, kind of on the leading edge of this technology. Um, wh where do you think folks are going to apply it? And uh, what, what, what do you think are some of the takeaways that may come out of the pandemic around this? I mean, for us, we, we've seen it almost in every industry that we've, we've touched. Um, I think that it, it's going to become more and more commonplace. Um, you know, any, any type of manufacturing. I mean, for us, during the COVID pandemic, um, the Innovation Center, we, we shifted and pivoted a little bit to, to help with PPE, supplying hospitals and things like that. Um, with face masks and, and areas like that. And, and we're seeing that not only in, you know, the heavy industry that we're in, but it's, it's, you can use additive manufacturing in almost any other manufacturing process in these other industries. Um, and so 
I see health, I see oil and gas, I see the energy. Um, eventually it's gonna get to the where it's gonna become more and more commercially available to um, residential. And so I, I, I really see additive manufacturing taking off. So much so that I've, I bought my kids a 3D printer and <laughs> they're, they're, they're five and 10 years old and they're already 3D printing toys. So it's, it, it's something that, that is going to be here for a long time. I think it's, if you back the clock, uh, I like to compare it to, you know, once you started to introduce CNC machining and, and how that changed your, your manufacturing setup across industries, that, that ability to have that quality, level of quality control in your, in your machines, all of the changes in terms of how you can run programs. It's the same with additive, right? It, it, I, I can't see why you sh anywhere where you today have basically a CNC machine of some sort or a casting, casting equipment, uh, an additive piece of equipment will probably be either replacing that or being next to it as a substitute, depending on what type of uh, product requirements you're having. But it's it, it's going to be relevant in basically any type of industry where you make stuff. Yeah, I think that's um, you know one of the themes I think has emerged throughout the course of the discussions we've been having over the last uh, four or five weeks around this topic. Um, is the fact that it's um, widely applicable and, and perhaps is mostly based on that kind of mind shift, right? It's uh, sort of getting to a place where you start to say, oh, wow, this is a technology that's applicable. Uh, it is a real problem solving tool. Now, now where do I apply it? And that's not a industry specific area. Um, I think that's something that, that fits, fits all across industry. Um, you know, I know from our perspective, we've been thinking a lot about kind of the history of, of, of additive technology in general. And, um, we're nearing the 40th anniversary of the invention of the 3D printer in about uh, four or five years. And I think if we look at the history of industrial technology, it takes about 40 years uh, for us to figure out how to commercialize, uh, make it reliable, fit it into our workflows. So, you know, perhaps we are at kind of this really interesting inflection point. Um, we've spent enough time learning about the technology. Companies like Siemens have begun setting up really, you know, industrial scale operations around it. Now we've had this moment in time to show us, oh my, traditional manufacturing, um, there are some issues that we need to work on. There's some areas we need to invest in to be prepared for the world that we live in. The next couple of years could be very interesting, I think, based on those lessons. That's certainly where, where we're sitting. You know, we think the next two, three, four, five years, there could be a lot of interest in this technology uh, as people sort of take the lessons they've learned uh, out of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, we're, we're equally excited to see um, kind of what industries and where this goes. And I don't think we have a preconceived notion even as to what, what, what is that right industry? I think it's, uh, it's many places. I think it's companies like yours that are showing us uh, how this technology can actually be applied. Um, let's see. So we, we have uh, about uh, 10 more minutes. And so I want to make another call. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to keep uh, putting those in the chat bot. Uh, and we'll uh, try to make sure that we can answer um, as many of them as possible. Um, let's see, uh, I, have, I have another technical question around uh, sort of uh, design and shape. And so let me know, um, you know if, you, if you can answer this one. Um, so this is a question around uh, if a shape has an undercut, um, oftentimes this requires uh, supports, um, would this shape be able to be printed? So I guess it's a pretty broad question. Uh, and I think the answer might be, it depends. <laughs> but, um, but also, are there times when you can make something out of multiple? So like uh, in additive, we talk a lot about, you know, making one object, but are there some examples that you have where you've printed several parts, maybe, maybe some composite, some metal, and then um, brought them together into one final unit? So is that, is that something that you've seen as well, where you're basically breaking something down into smaller constituent parts? Definitely. That's something that we, we do all the time. Um, and that's part of the part of experimenting with the machines, figuring out what they can do, uh, the build volumes and things like that. Um, there's been plenty of times where we wanted to make something that was outside the volume. And so the engineers learn to splice, cut things, and then, you know, you figure out how to put them back together. And the guys have done a really great job of uh, figuring out that process. Um, you know, it's, it, for us, it's not, what you can do with the print, but what you can do with the print after the fact, right? There's a lot of times where we're putting in heat inserts to, to, to be able to thread things in into our composites, um, figuring out what we can do from, from the metal X standpoint and then also our, our metal additive manufacturing. So it's, there's a lot of machining, post-machining after the printing that we've learned to do 
um, and it really opens up of what you can do with with your overall design. And also the the speed of continued development of additive technologies, right? And, and what you can do with you know, you've got other startups coming and new ways of of you know controlling the equipment of of adding access to the printers. It's there's a lot of stuff in development, which means that with time, I, you know, it's it's very much our our own mental limits that's keeping us away from what potentially achievable using a variety of additive technologies and as Cliff said you break it down into pieces you, you reassemble it you, you create something out of multi-parts multi-materials it's it's our own I think very much our own limited way of designing for AM that that's holding us back and of course yeah the, the printing technology as well right? there's a lot of maturity to be found in before it's it's a, a mature technology but that's part of the fun it's it's developing very very quickly yeah, I think that, that is um, that's very much how we see it. We, we have a, a saying at Mark Forge, you know, um, ultimately the reason why we're here, why we're doing this is that we want to enable people to build anything that they can imagine. And I think that um, that's always been the dream, right, as, of engineering is that the, the space from the design you have in your head to the actual physical object, uh, all those barriers in the middle go away. Uh, it's fast, it's straightforward, it's easy. Um, you know, I think we have a, a long way to go to, to reach a world where it just happens like that in magic. But, but I think that is the process we're all on is, you know, what, what are the things we can do to start knocking down those mm -hmm. barriers that separate us from, from the designs we have in our head uh, and making them physical reality. And I know that's, that's why a lot of us uh, get up every day because <laughs> it's, it's a really, really fun set of creative challenges. Um, let's see, uh, another question from Ashton here, um, a question around modular housings. Uh, and also maybe how additive works in the construction industry. So I know maybe maybe this one is not um, di directly on the things you work on, but I think Pontus, you have some ideas here. Uh, well, it's I mean it's, just, it's additive, right? And we need to stay on track of all the cool developments that happen. Yes, you, I mean you have concrete three D printers. It's just amazing what you can do with those, even though it's not something we see as any use ourselves. But also when you look at what's happening around metal side so you, you, you know I think there's a bridge in in Holland or the Netherlands that is 3d printed with robotic arms so you have basically a bridge crossing a channel that's printed in metal uh, with basically weld heads laying out and a 3d printed bridge construction it's the possibilities are there so I think again when it comes to the design freedom that we give to an architect it's just insane relative you know stacking bricks as it used to be at one time so going from stacking bricks to having that free form, whether it's of concrete or, or metal, it's, uh, it's, it's to me, it's, a, it's not my specialty area, but it's still, it's mind boggling. What, you know, wow, the stuff you, you know, what my kids drew when they were four years old that looked like crazy buildings. Well, I could probably build that today. So it's, yeah, Cliff, keep your kids going on that and we'll see what, exactly. what the future holds. <laughs> Uh, so that, uh, yeah, so absolutely, in terms of modular housing, whether it's modular or, or one-off insane concepts, I think additive will provide some possibilities around all of that. Yeah, and, uh, and, and we, we also, you know, from Mark Forge's perspective, right, um, yeah, we, we, we know that the set of 3D printing technology is extremely wide, right? We, we have an area that we specialize in. Uh, we're, we're trying to, you know, evolve it over time, but we love seeing the innovation that's happening uh, really across the industry because there's so many different problem spaces require specific kinds of material, specific sizes, uh, specific kinds of characteristics. And so it's, uh, we, we agree, it's, it's, um, it's awesome to see the number of people who are trying out new ideas in this area. Um, question here from Joe, um, in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, from your perspective, are there any outstanding critical technology breakthroughs that are needed to make 3D printing become more mainstream? Or is it really more of a mindset or cultural change at this point? Um, you know, maybe it is sort of the creation of innovation centers and getting people to understand how to use the technology that really is the actual uh, barrier to making it mainstream. But I don't know from your perspective, is there a, a few technical challenges that need to be uh, overcome or where are we? I mean, if I look at it from a day-to-day -day life and making people, you know, how do you get more people to make, to make additive components? Well, first of all, you need to, to create the CAD files, right? You need to be able to design stuff three-dimensionally. So I guess, you know, there, there are some, <laughs> depends what you mean with real mainstream, but there are some genuine challenges, right? In terms of your way of 
thinking and, and using digital tools to create a pod. So uh, that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a tough question. Cliff, stop laughing at me and say something. <laughs> <laughs> No, it definitely comes down to, I don't think it's a, a technology breakthrough, but it is a, it is a cultural shift. Yeah. Uh, you have to get people to start thinking three-dimensional versus a, a 2D drawing and things like that. And that's, that's not something that's easily done. You can't really go from 2D to 3D unless you've had that experience in training and education. So that is the, a little bit of shift you do. And, that, and that's something that I work with my boys on is, is to get them a they're already using CAD programs at you know five and ten years old. Is is to eventually start thinking in three D space, so that you can start doing three D printing and manufacturing. So. Yeah, I, lo I love that. And thinking thinking of it through the lens of uh, yeah, people growing up today um, becoming you know familiar with this, right? And we have you know all kinds of video games, you know my, uh, Minecraft, etc. But the yeah. idea that you know you can manipulate three dimensional space in the virtual world, and then turn it into reality, right? Like that. Yeah. That I think. Um, <laughs> to someone who's growing up as a kid is an amazing opportunity. We, we talk about all the things we need to do to build anything you can imagine, but uh, that's pretty magical to like a you know, five-year-old, right? <laughs> no, definitely. And they see things from a totally different perspective. And my kids ask me questions. They're like, why do you do this? I'm like, I didn't even think of that. And it's, you know, but that's, that's, that's the great thing of, of learning and, and working with, with, with younger kids is that, that they do have those different perspectives and new ideas and it's, it's, it's great. Awesome. Uh, I think I think we're going to end on that note. Uh, unless unless uh, um, uh, Pontus or Cliff, do you, uh, you want to add anything else? So we didn't now, uh, just looking at the historical perspective. So I used to build with Lego bricks, and then you have kids building in Minecraft, where you have virtual any piece, but it's still you limited certain you know, size of blocks or shape of blocks. And then you have Cliff's kids, and they will make stuff I can't think of because they will have, I don't know if they can cat stuff, then you know approaching infinite dimensions to work with it's it's going to be fun right to see what happens it definitely will be that's a, that's a perfect note to end on which is uh yeah uh this technology is uh is definitely uh you know e e in the process of becoming uh widespread but we have a, a younger generation coming up who who may be native to it uh and it's super exciting to see all the things that uh, that they will build <laughs> over, over the time, because uh, I think I think we have a lot of building to do. I think that's one of my takeaways from the pandemic is that we have got a lot of infrastructure to work on. We got a lot of things to build. We got a lot of problems to solve. So um, I want to thank uh, Cliff and Pontus uh, today for joining us. Um, really learning a lot about uh, your perspectives and backgrounds uh, in additive and some of the cool things that Siemens Energy is doing. Um, I want to uh, make a shout out for the audience. Um, we have a couple more events coming up in the series. Um, the next one I'll call your attention to is uh, next Tuesday at uh, 10 o'clock a.m. Uh, Eastern Time. Uh, it's going to be a chat with the CEO of Caldwell Manufacturing uh, to learn a bit about how uh, Caldwell, which is a door and window manufacturer, is using additive technology as part of their operations. Um, so thanks again. Um, we've really been enjoying uh, these discussions. Uh, we look forward to seeing you back uh, next time and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.